Welcome to this video. This one is part 3 of this building recommender system using GNN with PyTorch series. Since our previous video covered how to do self-supervised learning with LightGCN, it will make sense to cover how to do supervised learning as well. So that's what this video is about. So let's get started. So let's revisit the concept of self-supervised versus supervised. Supervised learning uh, in the context of graph means the label comes from an external source. So in this case, we have an explicit rating for each edge, um, and that will be used as a label, and this will also dictate what loss function we use. In contrary, self-supervised learning doesn't rely on any external label, so it only relies on the graph structure. So for the data set we're using, we're still going to be using the latest small movie lens data sets. The setup is a little bit different. So in the supervised learning setting, um, because we want a model to learn every interaction, good or bad, and relying on the actual label and the loss function, RM RMSE, to do the, uh, the job, the training, and therefore, we use rating threshold is set to one, so which means any interaction between a user and item will be part of the graph. So the loss function here we use is RMSE. Um, is basically we have this y i, which is the the label, the actual rating minus y hat is the predict predicted rating between the item and the user, and RMSE is just the uh, the square sum and average and then square root. So that's that. Um, let's go to the code. So um, this is modified from the uh, the previous notebook. Uh, it's mostly the same. So imports is the same. Uh, the load data set is still the same. And then pre-processing is the same um, here just to make sure the uh, user ID and movie ID are both normalized to the range from 0 to the number of unique IDs. And then we print out the max to ensure that within range, right? So it's 600 and 9,000, if you recall previously. Without this, the movie ID can go up to almost 20,000. So low CSV here is a little bit different because we also need to have the true label. So the only difference here is I create this edge values list, and then here I basically based on the um, this edge a, edge attribute, you know, based on the rating, um, and then I append that to the edge value. So output will be edge index, which is the row and the column or you know was the first two list of the COO format, and then the edge list is actually the third list of the COO format. So if you go back to the COO format in the in the slides. So now, in this case, we actually have row, column, and data. So that actually mapped to edge index, which is the first two list, and then edge value is the last list. So now, um, let's run that. And then here, we're actually loading the, the data, and then we're using um, rating threshold equals one, as, as I explained, that we want to consider all the interactions, good and bad. And then we convert them to a tensor because uh, that's the uh, the data type that model would take. And then we kind of print out the size. Uh, and then, of course, the edge index is two times the total number of interactions. And then the edge value, the length is just total number of interactions. And then here we are creating number of users and number of items as global variable. So they can be easily uh, referenced later on. So the next two helper functions, uh, these are essentially what this, um, essentially, essentially what this part is doing. I explained my first uh, part one and part two. Essentially, it's converting from interaction matrix of a bipartite graph into an adjacency matrix so that the row ID and column ID uh, can be uh, referring to the, the same node and there's no confusion whether uh, row 1 and column 1 are, are referring to the same node or not. So, so that's what this con conversion is for. So these two helper functions essentially 
are doing that, I, ha I had a very uh, extensive explanation of what these two methods are doing in the part one video. Um, the only difference here is I also added the uh, input edge value because when we do the conversion, we also need to output not just the indices, but also the values. So therefore, there's these, these two, and then, um, and then I incorporate them in, into the, the COO, and here I, I added as part of the, um, the, the, uh, the bigger matrix. Um, so there, that's that. And then from there, we do the, the trend uh, test validation split. Uh, once again, validation set here is not for cross-validation and hyperparameter tuning. It's purely just to collect evaluation metrics as we train, so we can have a nice plot. So we did that, and then let's print out those variables that we just created. So um, everything looks good here, and then from here, we need to convert from interaction matrix to adjacency matrix uh, because that's actually the format that model would take. So let's do that. Oh, I forgot to run these. So let's run them. And then now it should be good. All right, let's print it out. So as, as you can see, the, um, the, size, um, the size sort of uh, doubled. Um, that's, that's because the, um, you know, we're converting from um, interaction matrix, matrix to, to adjacency matrix. So they're, they're doubled, which is expected. And then next thing is the model. Um, I explained in great detail what these math formula means in the part one video. So I'm going to skip it here. Um, in the actual model definition or implementation, everything else is pretty much the same, uh, except for I add a linear layer that takes in the uh, basically twice of the embedding vector size, um, and then I'll put just one value. So this way, I can have a user embedding for a given uh, for a given user item embedding for a given item, and then I basically concatenate them. Um, um, so if the input, the default dimension is 64, then I will take a one size of 120a input, and then I'll put just a one value, which uh, is a uh, predicted rating of those uh, two nodes. In terms of forward, it's pretty much the same up until here, um, where which I convert the input adjacency matrix, and I want to get the, um, the interaction matrix index, um, and the reason is that with that, then I can get the, uh, the user embeddings and item embeddings from the interaction matrix pretty easily, because the first row is user, and the second row is item. And then with these two, then I can concatenate them on dimension one um, to get the uh, an output that is, you know, of dimension of edge index length times one twenty eight. And then this is basically uh, fit into the uh, the linear layer that I, I created uh, right here. And then it will output one value that refers to the predictor rating. So in, in the context of a matrix, if I, if I input matrix, then the output would just be the number of interactions times one. Uh, that would be the dimension. A message here uh, is, is basically the same as uh, the previous video. So here, let's define a model. Training here, I'm, I'm defining the, uh, some of the parameters. And then let's print the batch size. And here is pretty much the same, except for I'm using uh, MSC or RMSC as the loss function. Everything else is the same. Get recall at K. This is exactly or basically exactly the same as the video I made on the neural collaborative filtering. So essentially, you take in the edge index, and then you take in the input edge value. So 
this is the actual the true label, the actual rating, and this is the list of predictor rating. And based on these two, and uh, based on this uh, input edge index that has a user ID, then you can compute recall at K and precision at K. So here I call overall recall overall precision. Um, so let's run this. And then here, it's just for convenience. I don't have to convert them back and forth over and over again. Um, I, I take the, uh, this is the uh, adjacency matrix edge index. Um, I convert them back to the uh, interaction matrix, uh, as well as the value, and then you will see why. So in the training loop, um, so the first step is I basically push in my training index, training values, uh, these are both in adjacency matrix format, and I will get a predictor rating. If you recall in, in the model, um, this is actually in the RMAT format. So let's grow up to the model, right? So here I did the conversion uh, from adjacency matrix to R matrix, uh, interaction matrix. Therefore, the output um, predictor rating can be aligned with the interaction matrix. And that makes it very easy to do uh, the uh, the recall at case. So that's that. And then I do the, the training loss. And here, um, this I don't, this is sort of optional, but essentially because this is size of one times one, and this is just a list, I basically use this dot view as a reshape to make it the size one, plus, uh, one times one. So, and then this is just doing the gradient descent. And in the validation, it's very, very similar. Uh, you push through the model, and then you get the, a list of the predictor rating, and then you compute loss based on predicted and actual rating, and then you compute recall and precision. So let's run this. The training is going to take quite a while. It's going to take about an hour, 20 minutes. So we'll fast forward. All right, let's see if the training is finished. Hundred percent looks like it finished, and let's see what's the um, the recall validation recall at K at the uh, the very end. So it's around thirty two percent. So let's plot them. As you can see, the trend and then validation loss basically had a sharp drop uh, around here, like I'll say five hundred ish iteration ish, and then basically it goes very very slowly. Then let's plot the recall at K. So recall at K, as you can see, it goes up and then kind of plateaued at 35%. If you remember in our previous video with the self-supervised learning, it was only able to get up to around 14.5%. And because this is supervised learning and we actually have true labels or actually apply true label for the training, and it's sort of expected the recall is, is doing better. So let's just run a quick uh, test on our test sets. So yeah, recall at K is about 33%, and then precision is about 56%, so, um, so pretty similar to what we saw uh, above. So that's it for this example on using LightGCN with the supervised learning. Um, before we end this video, I would like to cover this uh, very important concept, which first of all is about the limitation of LightGCN. So one of the big limitations of LightGCN model is that it's not transductive, it's inductive. And what does that mean? What does that phrase mean? So Transductive and inductive in the sense, uh, in the context of graph, transductive just means all the validation tests and training sets are on the same graph. So if you remember how we do the split in our code, we basically take the 
the edge index, and we basically just split them based on I think it was eighty percent, ten percent, ten percent. So that's transductive learning. Inductive learning basically means your training validation and test sets are on completely different graphs. So you need to split your input data differently, such that if you're in a training graph, you have these sets of nodes and these sets of interactions. In, in, in a uh, validation test sets, those nodes don't even exist in your training graph. And then your model has to learn it. So let's look at uh, a more detailed example. So for example, you're in, in a transductive learning setting. The original graph looks like this with five nodes. And then we have one, two, three, four, five. Actually, yeah, five edges. So in a training set, we basically say, um, in a training set, actually there are six edges. In a training set, we basically say we're gonna take these edges, one, five, two, five, two, four, and then three, four, these edges. And then when we do the, the, the random sample to calculate loss, then we have this, you know, we, we sample this one between four and three, right? And then we use that to calculate loss and then do gradient descent and all that. And then in the validation set, then we say, okay, now let's verify that uh, between four and five, and then that we know there's an edge, but let's pass it through the model and calculate the loss, and then also calculate other evaluation metrics that we're interested. And similarly for test set. But the gist is they're all using the same original graph. Uh, they're all using the basically the same sets of nodes. In contrast, inductive learning, they're on completely different graphs. So for example, here you have node one through four, five, and here, node 6 through 10, right? And then 11 through 15. So they're basically completely different graphs. I mean, obviously, the original graph, these can all be from the same big graph. But when you do the splitting, you basically had to make sure that all the nodes in your training set don't even interact with anything in your validation set or test sets. Um, so now, I, I'm assuming you sort of understand why LightGCN is not able to do this because if you remember when we do the setup um, and then we, when we initialize the model, we actually uh, build our embedding um, based of kind of the, the, uh, the node index, right? And then we learned the embedding sort of like matrix factorization. Um, and so when we do inference, when we do prediction, then we already have the embedding through one, uh, from one to five. But then here, it's, it's totally different, and we've never seen this graph before, so it's not able to do that. But uh, to overcome this limitation, there are other models that can do this. So for example, this uh, graph sage proposed by a Stanford researcher is actually able to do that. So instead of having uh, you know, a set of embedding vectors, and then we learn those for each of the nodes, which is very limited to just the graph that the model has seen. Uh, this Sage, uh, Sage uh, graph Sage actually, um, the model is not learning the embedding. It's actually learning how you aggregate these uh, these nodes. So it's actually learning the aggregation function, and by doing that, it's able to make the model inductive. So this is something we're going to cover in the future. So. Um, that's it for this video. Uh, hopeful, hopefully it's helpful. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the comment section. So thank you for your support and thank you for watching.